Due to the Nashville mass murderer's manifesto being leaked, where it was clear this deranged individual was motivated by anti-white hatred, this video is about the white lightning of Benjamin Franklin and Michael Faraday. Anti-white hatred is stirred up and used by the mass media against whites. In the face of this, there is little to no white unity. If you are white, you can expect your white employer or supervisor to undermine you, to gossip about you and to leave you to the wolves. So we see a large portion of whites leave the American economy every year, e for example, 96% of new jobs in 2022 went to non-whites, according to Bloomberg. This breakdown is in direct contrast to scientists of the past, who not only looked up to and emulated each other, but defended each other and built on each other's work. The following is an excerpt of the Proceedings of the American Philosophical Society, published in 2006. In contemplating the careers of Franklin and Faraday, one encounters the confluence of many common, and a number of contrasting, characteristics. Franklin and Faraday, at different times, were each the best known and most admired of men in the Western world. Franklin during the last half of the 18th century, Faraday, who was born 18 months after Franklin's death in 1790, during the middle half of the 19th century. Each discovered a large variety of new phenomena, and each was associated with some of the most spectacular, and dangerous, experiments ever performed, the fabled, kite experiment in the case of Franklin, which demonstrated that the source of lightning is electrical, the electrified cage, which established that a conducting body is charged on the outside, in the case of Faraday. Electricity was of central importance in their scientific endeavors, its nature, its creation, its control, its utilization. Each in their different ways, and in different contexts, established a language of electrical discourse. The terms battery and positive and negative electricity, and the immensely important principle of electroneutrality, all came from Franklin, the words electrolysis, electrolyte, anode, cathode, and ion, and the demonstration that matter and electricity are inextricably connected, came from Faraday. Point two, both Franklin and Faraday achieved mastery over nature without outward prompting they were driven by some compelling, ineffable, intrinsic curiosity. They each believed passionately in prudence, skepticism, intellectual honesty and the sanctity of evidence. And their accomplishments afforded proof that being highly cultured, and even learned, does not necessarily imply formal education. Both Franklin and Faraday had an extremely wide range of scientific interests, and their creative intelligence and versatility were exceptional. The scientific books that they wrote were hugely popular, and the titles of their most famous scientific texts were uncannily similar. Franklin, Experiments and Observations on Electricity, Faraday, Experimental Researches in Electricity. Like Franklin, Faraday wrote with charm and candor, and Joseph Priestley, referring to Franklin, noted the modesty with which the author proposes every hypothesis of his own and the noble frankness with which he relates his mistakes when they were corrected by subsequent experiments. Such honesty would endear these scientists to their fellow scientists for generations. It was Faraday's laws of electrolysis discovered in 1833 that first showed matter is electrical in its nature. The combination of chemical elements to form compounds is governed by the same electrical force that lay at the heart of electricity. In the words of Richard Feynman, this was one of the most dramatic moments in the history of science, one of those rare moments when two great fields come together and are unified. Faraday was not a self-critical scientist, or was a self-critical scientist. He was a deeply religious man. His favorite verse in the Bible occurs in the book of Job 9. If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I am perfect, it shall also make me perverse. He was generous and encouraging to others, but ferocious in the criticism of his own work. Despite their towering achievements and iconic status, both Faraday and Franklin had rather poor elementary schooling. Franklin left school at 10 and at the age of 12 was indentured to a printer through his older brother. Faraday, when he was 13, became an apprentice and errand boy to a London bookbinder and bookseller, which provided him with the opportunity of reading widely. Franklin became a rich businessman. He promoted the establishment of such public services as a fire department, a lending library, and an academy, and he was the founder of a wonderful learned society. 
He also had homes in London, Paris, and Philadelphia. Faraday lacked the public, civic, political, diplomatic, and legislative skill of Franklin. In contrast to the affable, humorous, witty, effulgent, and gregarious Franklin, who was not averse to indulging in flirtatious talk and action, Faraday was of a retiring, almost reclusive nature. He almost shunned socializing. Yet in his day, especially from the 1830s onwards, after his sensational discovery of electromagnetic induction, he was a leading figure in Victorian England. Prince Albert, Victoria's regent, befriended him and attended many of his lectures, and among those with whom he interacted were the painters Turner and Constable and the writers Ruskin, who would influence Wilde, and Dickens, who would influence Poe. Indeed, Charles Dickens occasionally, Charles Darwin frequently, and Charles Wheatstone invariably attended his discourses at the Royal Institution in London. Lightning is a phenomenon that will forever be associated with the name of Benjamin Franklin, and the lightning rod of Franklin has had many beneficial consequences. For example, the Campanile in Venice has been standing for more than a millennium, but early records refer to several fires and destruction. The structure was struck by lightning in 1388, 1417, and again in 1489. Lightning damaged the tower severely in 1548, 1565, 1653, and in 1745 when it was almost destroyed. Further damage was sustained in thunderstorms in 1761 and 1762. This was the ideal building for a Franklin lightning rod. So in 1766, one was installed, and the Campanile had a more comfortable existence until 1902, when a major catastrophe occurred with a fall of 13,000 tons of masonry. But it was not any inadequacy on the part of Franklin that caused this incident. Rather, it was the feeble tensile strength of the masonry that was the root cause of the destruction. Michael Faraday, the blacksmith's son, was born in London, and he revered Franklin and frequently quoted Franklin's work, especially the famous quote in response to the question of all scientists who achieve notable distinction encounter, of what use is this discovery? To which Franklin, later echoed by Faraday, replies, of what use is a newborn baby? Faraday worked in the bookbinder's shop as an apprentice until he was 21, when he was given tickets by a kindly customer in a stunning show of noblesse oblige in the spring of 1812 to go and listen and observe the most brilliant star in the European scientific firmament, Sir Humphrey Davy. The 34-year-old Humphrey Davy, a close friend of the poets William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Lord Byron, who you can learn more about on this channel, was already famous worldwide by the time the 21-year-old Faraday saw and heard him. Davy had discovered sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, strontium, and boron, and proved that chlorine is an element. He had invented the carbon arc and used it as a means of illumination. He had also discovered and de demonstrated the anesthetic properties of nitrous oxide, otherwise known as laughing gas. He had also rediscovered the secret of how to make Egyptian blue. Davy rediscovered the recipe for the mineral-based pigment known as Egyptian blue, which was used to decorate Nefertiti's crown. The x-ray fingerprints signify that Egyptian blue is calcium copper silicate. Davy combined elegance of literary expression with a brilliant scientific discovery. He wrote with incredible skill. This is what he said of Benjamin Franklin, whom he greatly admired. He has written equally for the uninitiated as well as the philosopher, and he has rendered his details amusing as well as persipatious. He was a brilliant lecturer. His lectures were delivered with grace and charm. They were very well rehearsed and fluently delivered. It was Faraday who clamored for a role in Davy's laboratory, and he was entrusted with cleaning glasses. He was then entrusted with the preparation of samples of the newly discovered nitrogen trichloride, a very explosive substance. He assisted Davy in the construction of the miner's safety lamp, an invention that further enhanced Davy's fame. Starting in October 1813, Michael Faraday accompanied Davy and his wife and a mobile laboratory on an extended European tour lasting almost 18 months. 
It took them to Paris, Montpellier, Milan, Genoa, Turin, Florence, Geneva, and many other European cities. During the course of the tour, they met Ampère, Arago, Gay-Lussac, and Volta. All the while, Davy and Faraday conducted experiments. They isolated and identified iodine while in Paris. And on a daily basis, Faraday received expert tuition from Davy. He also required a working knowledge of French and Italian. They returned in May 1815, and thereafter, Faraday's car career could hardly be stopped. He liquefied for the first time some 20 gases, including ammonia, the basis of early and later refrigeration. He discovered and established the chemical formula of benzene, which he prepared by distillation of fish oil. He invented the first electric motor in 1821, the same year he was married. He pioneered organic photochemistry, that is, he harnessed sunlight to synthesize new organic compounds. He became a superb analytical chemist. He identified isomers of chemical compounds, showing that isobutylene, which he was the first to prepare, has an empirical chemical formula exactly the same as that of ethylene. He prepared the sulfonic acid derivatives of naphthalene, the precursors of industrial dye. He improved the optical quality of glass, and it was he who first drew glass fibers of a kind that later were used as light guides. He prepared stainless alloy cutthroat razors made of iron and platinum that are still sold today. He pioneered the study of dielectrics, and such was the magnitude of his contribution to this field that the unit of capacitance is named a farad in his honor. In 1829, he wrote a masterly text, nearly 700 pages, on chemical manipulation, which one of the greatest organic chemists of the 20th century was to praise in such terms as to advocate perusal of it by modern practitioners of organic chemistry. He studied catalysts, colloidal metals, and ionic conductivity in inorganic solids such as lead, during which he was the first to note the new topical subject of superionic conductivity. He also identified the phenomenon of semi-conductivity and it, what is now termed thermistor action. He was so prodigal in his output, it is arguable that he left a greater corpus of scientific discoveries than any other scientist before or since, including Einstein. Lord Rutherford in 1931 called him the greatest scientific discoverer ever, and his successor as director of the Royal Institution, John Tyndall, set out in a series of discourses in 1868, later published as a book, The Astonishing Chronicle of Faraday as a Discoverer. Arguably, his greatest single discovery was that of electromagnetic induction. He argued that a magnetic field surrounded a magnet, and he later argued that a gravitational field surrounds every solid object. It is this theory and ability that helped us get into space. In fact, Faraday was the founder of field theory. Faraday, in his mind's eye, could picture lines of force emanating from a magnet, and he illustrated the reality of this picture by sprinkling iron filings on a paper beneath which he placed a magnet. His lines of force ushered a new era into physics and cosmology, an era built on the concept of field, which pervades the space around a magnet and around an electric current, and in the words of James Clerk Maxwell, weaves a web through the sky. In 1845, Faraday made his historic discovery that the plane of polarization of a beam of light on passing through a slab of glass could be rotated by the application of a magnetic field. This experiment proved that every beam of light has a minute magnetic and also a minute electrical component. This introduced the ability for humans to control light. This is the so-called Faraday effect in magneto-optics. A few weeks after he made this discovery, he dispatched to the Royal Society a paper entitled On the Magnetization of Light and the Illumination of Magnetic Lines of Force, which begins with a sentence of timelessness. I have long held an opinion, almost amounting to conviction, in common I believe with many other lovers of natural knowledge, that the various forms under which the forces of matter are made manifest have one common origin or in other words, are so directly related and mutually dependent that they are convertible, as it were, one into another, and possess equivalents of power in their action. 
Here is a reflection of his religious Christian conviction. He read the book of nature written by the finger of God alongside the direct word of God, the Bible. Faraday could legitimately be regarded as the father of electrochemistry, but he never forgot to thank his father God. The laws of electrolysis discovered by him in 1833 are among the most accurate in the whole of the physical sciences, and they enable the unit of change to be quantitatively defined. The principle of electromagnetic induction, which he discovered in 1831, prompted him shortly thereafter to inquire whether, and indeed to demonstrate that, all the various forms of electricity, irrespective of their mode of generation, by induction, by a voltaic pile, via friction, or by an electric eel, are identical. Magnetochemistry is another major subject discovered by Faraday in 1845. He had earlier built the most powerful magnet in the world. He soon found out that apart from ferromagnetism exhibited by iron and cobalt, all substances are either attracted to or repelled by a magnetic field, no matter how slight. In a frenetic two-month period, he tested the magnetic properties of everything he could lay his hands on. Not just iron, but bismuth, iodine, lead, wood, meat, vegetables, and gases such as nitrogen and oxygen. He found that nitrogen was repelled by a magnet, whereas oxygen was attracted. The outcome of this is the control of gases using just magnets. The former is said to be diamagnetic and the latter paramagnetic, two terms coined by Faraday for nitrogen and oxygen. Faraday also reported the paramagnetism of hemoglobin in the blood. And in 1936, Linus Pauling and his colleague published a paper taking Faraday's observations on the magnetic properties of blood as their starting point. In it, they showed that two paramagnetic substances, hemoglobin and oxygen, upon combination to form oxyhemoglobin, produced a diamagnetic substance. This inspired Max Perutz to persevere with his revolutionary work on the structure of hemoglobin, work that led in 1962 to his being the joint recipient with Sir John Kendrew of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. In 1836, Faraday carried out his famous cage experiment, which would later influence Nikola Tesla, when he built a 12 foot by 12 foot by 12 foot metallic structure covered in fine wire mesh, one side of which had a door through which he could step inside. With the cage insulated from the earth, it was charged via an external machine to a potential of approximately 150,000 volts. This caused large sparks, sparks and flashes, artificial lightning, at the outside of the cage. But Faraday, holding a sensitive electrometer, was unperturbed and unaffected by this fierce electrical activity. This demonstrated, in a daring fashion, that an electrified body carries its charge on the outer surface, a fact that is reassuring to remember when we fly as passengers in a jet aircraft through storms and lightning. Faraday was also a lady's magnet. Mary Somerville, an excellent mathematician who translated Laplace's work into English, and after whom Somerville College, Oxford, is named, sent letters of admiration to Faraday. In a letter to her composed on the 1st of March, 1834, when he was married, he writes, Dear Madam, I cannot refuse myself the pleasure any longer of thanking you for your kindness in sending me a copy of your work. I did intend to read it through first, but I cannot proceed so fast as I wish because of constant occupation. I cannot resist saying to what pleasure I feel in your approbation of my late experimental researches. The approval of one judge is to me more stimulating than the applause of thousands that cannot understand the subject. Ada, the Countess of Lovelace, was Lord Byron's daughter, and she was an exceptionally good mathematician who took an early interest as did her more prominent contemporary Charles Babbage in the forerunner of modern day computers. One of the first computers developed by the United States Navy was called Ada for her. The Countess, so it seems from extant letters she sent to Faraday, was infatuated with him. Was this due to his connection to Davy and thus her father? At one time, she pleaded with him to let her collaborate in his laboratories in repeating all his key experiments, a request that could not have been easy for him to deflect. She also told Faraday that she wished to be his bride in science. In 1826, 
Faraday started two educational initiatives that are still flourishing. He never hesitated to give back to his people. The first was the Christmas lectures for the school children of London. They instantly became triumphant successes, not least because Faraday himself gave them, replete with gripping demonstrations, 19 times. The story of Faraday is an excellent example of what can occur when the white community stands together as one.